Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to worship in this second week in the season of Epiphany. The Epiphany season is really focused on one thing, as is all the other rest of the, the church year. It's focused on Christ. The Epiphany season is all talking about how Jesus in His earthly ministry revealed to the world, to the people around Him, who He was. That He was true man. And He is also certainly true God. And so today, by looking at God's Word, where we hear about who our Savior is, we, we hear and are reminded of the most important thing about our Savior, and that He is indeed just that, our Savior. Today we focus how God's Word revealed to us that Jesus came for one mission, and that's to win for us the forgiveness of sins. So Lord's blessing as we focus on that precious gift where we find our foundation for our entire lives as Christians. And we're going to begin by singing our opening hymn, Father, God of Grace, You Knew Us. We'll sing verses 1 through 3. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sin, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, let us offer our confession to God. Heavenly Father, in your mercy, forgive us our sins of thought, word, and deed. Heavenly Father, in your mercy, forgive us for those sins we know we have done and the sins we don't know we have done. Heavenly Father, in your mercy, forgive us for our sins we have done in the open and our sins we have done in secret. Heavenly Father, in your mercy, forgive us of our sins. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, He has removed your guilt forever. You are His own dear child. We know this with all certainty and confidence. He tells us again and again in His Word, and He's given us this. The Lord suffered in order to bring to us the personal assurance that our sins are indeed forgiven. On the night our Lord Jesus was betrayed, He took bread, 
And we had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to him, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. The congregation is now invited to come forward and receive the Lord's Supper. Now in response to the good news of the forgiveness of our sins as heard through our Lord's words and also as heard and personally received through His body and blood in the Lord's Supper, we'll now sing a hymn in response to the final three verses of Father God of grace you knew us. Praise 
portion of God's Word that we're focusing on here this evening comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. When Jesus again entered Capernaum some days later, people heard that he was home. So many people were gathered together that there was no more room, not even by the door, and he was speaking the word to them. Some people came to him bringing a paralyzed man carried by four men. Since they could not bring, it, bring the man to Jesus because of the crowd, they dug through the roof above where he was. When they had made an opening, they lowered the stretcher on which the paralyzed man was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. But there were some experts in the law sitting there and thinking in their hearts, Why does this fellow speak like this? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins except God alone? Jesus immediately knew in his spirit that they were thinking this way within themselves. He asked them, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to tell a paralyzed man your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your stretcher, and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your stretcher and go home. At once the man got up, picked up the stretcher, and went out in front of everyone. So they were all amazed and glorified God. They said, we have never seen anything like this. This is the word of our Lord. And we'll now sing our next hymn, Praise the One Who Breaks the Darkness. How tragic. 
Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. That's awful. That's just, oh, I'm so sorry. These are some things that you might say to someone who's recently been struck with some sort of tragedy. Things that, that look to convey your, your sympathy to somebody. Your, your genuine love and care and concern to somebody who's been dealing with some sort of tragedy. Maybe it's an illness. Maybe it's a disease. Maybe it's an injury. Maybe it's a loss. Either way, we say these words to show oh, we feel for them. Perhaps the person that should certainly, as we consider what we're talking about tonight, receive the most sympathy as we look at our devotion lesson is the man who was paralyzed. Now, we don't know a lot about him. We don't know how long he was paralyzed, whether it was something from birth or something he just recently had happened to him. But either way, as we consider how challenging his life must have been, oh, our heart, our heart goes out for him. Every day. Every day he would just simply lay on his mat. That's all. Every day, no matter where he wanted to go or when he wanted to go there, he couldn't do it. Every day. Even the simplest and most routine task for you and me was impossible for him. Every day, he had to completely rely on somebody else. Friends, family, anybody who would reach out a lending hand every day. Now sure, things would be a little easier if he did have a good support group, a good group of friends, a good group of family. But even then, every portion of his life, or at least most of them, are going to be impacted in a negative way by this paralysis. Every day, my heart goes out for him. But if we can all agree, and I think we can, that sympathy is certainly due to this paralyzed man, and I think we can also agree that there are some other people that you and I know that should receive some sympathy. Our hearts should go out to Steve, Gloria, Eric, and Bree, and Mark, and Barb, and Patty, and Gary, myself, and all of you. Because you and I, from the time that we were born, from the very time we were conceived, have dealt with the worst disease out there crippling, disabling disease of sin. Just as paralysis would deeply impact so many areas of your life, so much more so does this disease of sin completely, absolutely take over every last aspect, every moment of our time here on earth. Because of this disease of sin, on our own, we have no joy. We have no confidence. We have no peace. We have nothing. Because of this disease of sin, we cannot live for God. We can't even do anything to please Him. Because of this disease of sin, we don't even know God. We cannot believe in Him, nor even see how much He loves us. This is nothing new. No, since the garden where the fall happened, every single human being has been plagued by this crippling disease. Everyone. Including the people in our devotion lesson. The people jam-packed into the house. The experts of the law that were standing by watching. Four men carrying the paralyzed man. And yes, the paralyzed man himself. All of them deeply impacted, infected, by this disabling, by this crippling, by this life-altering disease of sin. How tragic. How awful. But something happened. As we heard in our, our portion of God's Word for this evening from Mark 2, we heard something incredible, something amazing happen. As this man was lowered down through the roof to Jesus, Jesus performed a miracle for this man. He looked at him and said, Son, your sins are forgiven. Finally, there was a miracle to heal this man of his disabling disease. 
Now he could stand in peace, knowing his sins are forgiven. Now he could jump for joy, knowing that his sins no longer stand in front of him. He now had the strength that only the news of sins forgiven could give him. He was healed. Oh, and of course, uh, his paralysis was healed too. We can't just push that one off to the side because that's incredible too. Jesus healed a man who was not able to walk or move at all and all of a sudden he was walking as if nothing happened. And yet, that's not the miracle that takes center stage. As incredible as it is, that's not what matters here. No, this miracle is used for one purpose and one purpose only. So that for all the people watching, all the people crowded in the house, for the experts of the law, for the friends and for the man himself, that they might know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. And he does this for you and for me as well. Even though you and I weren't jam-packed into that house to see this incredible moment, he does the very same thing for you and for me. He shows us his power. So that we might know that He can and He has forgiven all our sins. Yes, Jesus looks at you and me in the eyes. Just as He did the paralyzed man and says, You, Steve, Gloria, Eric, Bree, Mark, Barb, Patty, Gary, you, all of you, your sins, they are forgiven. Oh, what a miracle. So what do we do? How, how do we even begin to react or respond to this incredible gift? Well, to answer that question, let's take a quick hypothetical look at our devotion lesson. Let's just say, for a moment, that we know what happens the next day. Let's say that this man who once was physically paralyzed wakes up and is paralyzed with fear and worry and doubt, wondering, doubting, what happened yesterday. Wondering if it is actually true that Jesus actually gave him the ability to walk again. Wouldn't he look for affirmation? Wouldn't he make top priority to hear, to have clarity, to even hear Jesus himself tell him, yes, it is true. Now, as we consider this hypothetical scenario, something that didn't happen, Perhaps see that it's not all that hypothetical as it lines up with what happens for you and me. Do we wake up every morning forgetting that Jesus forgave us? Probably not. But are there things? Are there enemies out there that tirelessly work, that stop at no end to make us forget that Jesus forgave us? You betcha. Satan is out there hurling lie after lie after lie your way and my way. Hurling lies of temptation saying, come on, it's not that big of a deal. And then hurling lies of guilt right after. Saying, really? Really? You did that? How can you possibly think that God's going to forgive you for that? We have the world looking to justify, looking to validate, Looking to say, you know what? You can do whatever you want. It's okay. When we have the enemy that's perhaps most dangerous and closest to home, our own sinful nature. That old sinful nature that every single day has his only mission of pointing us away from Christ and pointing us towards the world and Satan. Getting us to listen to those lies and, and yes, sometimes fall for those lives. So because all of this is all too true for all of us, wouldn't we want to hear words of affirmation? Wouldn't we too want to hear Jesus himself remind us again and again that no, 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 what those enemies have to say are, are false. And to be reminded of what's true. Well, thanks be to God. He does. With the constant assault against our faith, God gives constant reminders to strengthen our faith, to remind us of our forgiveness. What a joy. What an absolute joy that we get to gather together and confess our sins, knowing that we're going to hear Jesus say those words, you are forgiven. What a relief. 
What an absolute relief that you and I get to gather and gather together around the altar to receive Christ's true body and blood where He personally and visibly comes to us and says, you, you are forgiven. How amazing. How simply incredible it is that God has given us His Word that whenever we want, we can open it up and have Jesus personally tell us Gloria, Eric, Bree, Mark, Barb, Patty, Gary, all of you, your sins, they are forgiven. What a miracle. Now it's at this point that, that is the end of a classic infomercial where the voiceover, the narrator, in, in this ecstatic and, well, kind of cheesy voice, will say, all of these great things could be yours for this price. And if you call now, we'll double the offer. Or, in the end of a medicine commercial for some illness, you'll have the narrator nonchalantly list off this ridiculously mile-long list of potential side effects that could go along with it. But for Jesus, He came through His Word and revealed to us the only thing that we would ever need. The miracle of the forgiveness sins. And not just a double portion of it, but an endless supply. At no cost to us because it's paid in full. With no strings attached. With no side effects. Because He gives it to us freely. It is ours. So that we can jump, stand, enjoy. And so that we can yearn joyfully and thankfully to hear it again and again. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll now continue by praying uh, together using Psalm 130, a very appropriate psalm to use as a prayer and very appropriately fits in with our service today that talks about just the absolute joy that we have in forgiveness. Um, also in our prayers this evening, we'll be praying a prayer of thanksgiving again for Louise Greenwood. She is now out of the hospital. Um, not quite back home yet. She is in a rehab center um, getting her strength back physically and also the help with her breathing. Um, but she is moving in the right direction and we thank God for that. Um, also a prayer of thanksgiving as well for Diane Meyer who had knee replacement surgery this morning. Um, everything went well. It's a little bit of a longer road of recovery, but we ask God to give her strength and patience um, to help her in her recovery. So we'll begin by praying uh, responsibly Psalm 130. Out of the depths, I have called to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the sound of my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of guilt, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is pardon, so you are feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in his word, I have put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. Yes, more than watchmen wait for the morning. In our prayers, Lord, this evening, we bring before you our sisters in Christ, Louise Greenwood, as well as Diane Meyer. Lord, we ask you to continue to be with them as you have so far. Um, continue to strengthen them. And, um, continue to give them patience. Continue to give them um, um, their faith to trust in you. Trusting in your timing. Trusting in your plan. Um, and Lord, if it is your will and your plan, which we know is good and perfect, we ask you to continue to strengthen them to bring them back to full health. Israel, wait confidently for the Lord. Because with the Lord there is mercy. With Him there is abundant redemption. So he himself will redeem Israel from all its guilt. And now we now pray the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated now for our closing hymn, um, which is The King of Glory Comes. Comes the nation rejoices. Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. Who is the King of glory? How shall we call him? He is Emmanuel, the promised of ages. The King of glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. In all the Galilee, in city or village, he goes among his people, curing their illness. The King of glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. He gave his life for us, the Lamb of salvation. He took upon himself the sin of the nations. The King of glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. He conquered sin, that he truly has risen. And he will share with us his heavenly kingdom. The King of glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. Good evening. Just a, a couple of quick announcements I want to highlight for you. Um, in the bulletin, um, we put information and another reminder about our voters meeting uh, this upcoming set Sunday, so actually not this one, but the week after, January 24th. Um, and so what we've included in here is some instructions of how to access this meeting via Zoom. Um, we're still waiting to hear on some details about what our region here in Illinois will do. Hopefully tomorrow we'll, we'll hear a little bit more clarity as to what um, if any of the, the restrictions will be loosened or relaxed. If so, Lord willing, we're hoping to maybe have this meeting in person on the 24th. Um, however, um, just in case that doesn't happen, we're including instructions this week and next week to just how to access this meeting via Zoom. Uh, the reason we're giving all these detailed instructions, and if we do have it via Zoom, I'll, I'll explain it more deeply next week, is just so that we can take any obstacle away from anybody from not going, because we simply, we want all of you to come as this is a great way for you to, first of all, be updated on what's going on at your church and also um, be you know, aware of ways you can serve, or at the very least, um, or not the least, um, probably the most, is to encourage um, people in, in our ministry with, with your prayers and support. Um, and so that's on January 24th. Uh, the time got moved back half an hour to 12.30. Just simply, if it is via Zoom, that would give enough time for myself and everyone attending the 11 o'clock service on that Sunday to get home if need be. Um, but like I said, we're, we're hoping to hear more tomorrow about um, Region 1, and so we'll announce via flock notes, um, whether it'll be um, via Zoom or in person sometime next week. Um, so look for that announcement. And then uh, the other announcement I wanted to highlight is what you see up here on the screen. So um, in the Epiphany season, usually there's a good um, handful of Sundays and weeks that are in that. Um, we're going to be taking a step back from that uh, church calendar and having a stewardship series. That is having a three-week church and Bible class focus on Christian stewardship. Now, when we hear the word stewardship, um, sometimes it tends to be a word that um, maybe carries 
I don't want to use baggage, but maybe that's kind of the best word that comes to mind, is a word that carries baggage, that it's only focused on one thing, um, and that's financial giving, and that's it. Um, and it's easy when, we, when we're focused on that to not see the big picture and see what stewardship is actually all about. Um, so as you see in this here, um, perhaps you can tell the, the background of the wood planks are a little fuzzy. That's because they're zoomed in. Um, but when we take a step back and look at what Christian stewardship actually means, we get the bigger picture. Christian stewardship is not just about this obligated giving um, to God, but the thankfulness to God. Stewardship is how we say, Lord, wow, look at what you've done for me. Look at everything you've done for me. And that's how we then go in responding to God. Um, and so our stewardship is, is, like everything else, is founded and rooted in Christ, in the good news of sins forgiven. That's our only source of motivation. That's our, our source and our foundation for stewardship. And so in these three weeks, we're going to be talking about what God's Word has to say about stewardship, looking at three main areas, all starting with T. So we're thanking God with treasure, we're thanking God with time, and we're thanking God with talents. Um, again, all rooted, and we'll be reminded of in these three weeks, all rooted in Christ and His love for us. So look forward to that in the, in the weeks to come as we talk about what God's Word has to say about stewardship. Um, so that's all as far as announcements go. So what we'll do now is we'll go into our um, time spent in the Word. This is the very back page of your bulletin. Uh, today we're looking at what would have been the first lesson um, from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 14 through 25. Um, as I read here, um, you'll be thinking of one question um, in particular. Um, what does God mean when he says, don't remember the former things? I'm going to do a new thing. So as you consider and listen to the context of, of Isaiah 43, consider what God means by that. And then also think of any other um, thoughts, comments, questions that strike you as you read, read through these verses. So, if you want to follow along, I'll go ahead and start reading uh, verse 14 here. This is what the Lord says. The Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake, I am taking action against Babylon. And I will bring down all the Chaldeans as refugees in the ships over which they rejoice. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's Creator, your King. This is what the Lord says. Who makes a road through the sea and a path through mighty waters. Who brings out the chariot and the horses, the army and the strong warrior. They will all lie down together. They will not get up. They are extinguished like a wick. They go out. Do not remember the former things. Do not keep thinking about ancient things. Watch. I am about to do a new thing. Now it will spring up. Don't you know about it? Indeed. I will make a road in the wilderness, in the wasteland. I will make rivers, the wild animals, the jackals, and the ostriches who will honor me. Because I am providing water in the wilderness, rivers in a parched wasteland, water for my chosen people to drink. This people that I form for myself will declare my praise. But you have not called on me, O Jacob. Instead, you have become weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought me sheep as your full burnt offerings. You did not glorify me with your sacrifices. I did not make you serve me with a grain offering. I did not make you weary with demands for incense. You did not purchase fragrant cane for me with silver or satisfy me with the vat of your sacrifices. Instead, you have made me serve because of your sins. You have made me weary because of your guilt. I, yes, I am He. I blot out your rebellious deeds for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. So as we consider what Isaiah, what God is saying through the prophet Isaiah here in Isaiah 43, um, that first question, what's, what's the point? God says, do not remember the former things. I am going to do a new thing. What do you think God meant by saying this? Talking about sending a savior? 
Okay, that's, that's absolutely part of it. So this is, this is an example when it comes to promises that God makes. Um, there's a couple different ways that those promises are fulfilled. Sometimes it's solely focused on one thing and one thing alone. And other times, it's focused on one thing but yet has a temporary fulfillment of that. So, um, for instance, there are promises given to King David that a son will come after him who will rule in his kingdom. Now certainly, that's focusing on Christ who will come from his line. But also has some temporary fulfillment with King Solomon, his son, who would rule after him. Um, or as an example of one where it's solely focused on one thing, just Christ, you think of when Isaiah earlier in his book wrote um, the promise that a, um, a virgin will give birth to a son and name him Emmanuel. Well, there's only one person that that can be talking about, and that's Christ. But here's an instance where it's talking about two things. Finally, it's focused, as you said very well, Gary, that it's focused on the forgiveness of sins, on sending a Savior. Look, I am doing a new thing. Don't get caught up in the past. Look ahead to what I am promising you. But it's also got a temporary fulfillment into their situation where they are now. So currently, um, they're in the Babylonian captivity. They're stuck in exile in Babylonia. And God's people are beginning to wonder, beginning to grumble. Beginning to look back and say, Oh, remember when God brought us out of Egypt? Why won't He do that here? And so God recounts that for them, saying, I am the one who brought you out of Egypt. I am the one who led you through the dry land when I parted the seas. I am the one who led the army and chariots after you so that they could be swallowed up in the seas. But stop remembering the former things. Of course, he's not saying, don't ever think about or be thankful about what I did for you generations ago in Egypt. He wants them to, but he says, don't get so caught up in that that you forget that I am still your God who is faithful today. I will be bringing you out of Babylon, as he promises in here. I am doing a new thing. I will lead you out of Babylon. I will make a path for you through the wilderness so that you will get home. I promise. I will bring you out of captivity. So the... The two ways that this promise is, is fulfilled, it, he says, I will bring you out of physical captivity in Babylon, in, from Babylon, but I will bring you also out of spiritual captivity and sin. Look, I'm doing a new thing. So that's what he really wants us to focus on, that look, what I promised, it'll happen. So after we kind of talked about that one, taking a step back and looking at kind of the rest of here, are there other other comments, other thoughts that strike you, that struck you, um, other questions that come to mind when you look at these verses. God's people have pretty much pushed God out of the picture. Um, God doesn't mince his words. Um, that last paragraph, he says, look, I didn't bear you down. I didn't make you a slave to the band. You bring these things to me. I've given you an opportunity to worship me, to offer these sacrifices for your benefit. And you haven't done it. You haven't brought me anything. You have pushed me out of the picture. You, you, you have been unfaithful to me. Um, which is really, really incredible and important to consider what he says right after that. With zero transition, he jumps from saying, you have been unfaithful to me, and yet, I will blot out your transgressions. I will not remember them anymore. Now that's, that's a clear, clear picture of grace. That despite our unfaithfulness to God, God is faithful to us. Um, any thoughts on, so God uses a number of different names and titles for himself in this section. He calls himself Lord, Redeemer, Holy One, um, Creator, King. Um, why, why do you think he would take time to use so many different names and titles for himself?
Yeah. This is a great chance that, I mean, God's using His names to refresh God's people's memory, to remind them of who He is. Because finally, we, we learn quite a bit about God just through the names and titles He has. He is the Redeemer, the one who buys us back from sin. He is the Lord. Uh, that name Lord first comes up when he's addressing Moses at the burning bush when he says, I am the Lord, the Lord, the God of, who is slow to anger, abounding in love, who is compassionate in mercy. Um, so that's the title that, that, that really follows along with the Lord, that he's the God of faithful grace. Um, he is the Holy One. He's perfect in everything he does, um, including in taking care of his people. He is their creator. If God created them and everything else, certainly he could handle taking care of them and watching over them, even as they're in exile. And he's their king, their leader. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot being told here through God's names. Um, another question to ponder at the very end, when he, when he switches over to, to reminding them that he's not going to remember um, their sins, he says, I blocked out your rebellious deeds for my own sake. Um, why do you think God makes that emphasis to say that He's doing this for His own sake instead of saying for your sake? What do you think that what God's communicating or telling us through that phrase? A a absolutely, He's showing He's showing who He is that He's a God of love. Um, what else? Why, why else do you think God would say, for my own sake, instead of saying, for your own sake? Well, if we did remember all of our sins, we'd all be going to hell instead of going to heaven. Yeah. He's doing this on His accord, because of who He is, for His sake. Not because of what we did. Not because of what we've earned. Because we're, we're, we're all pretty clear on what we've earned. And it's not good. Um, but yet God says, for my own sake, because of who I am, because I am a God of love, because I love you, I am doing this. Um, and for no other reason. Um, it's certainly just a clear, clear, clear reminder of, um, of His grace. Anything else? Any other comments? Or questions that, that struck you in these verses? When you said about your rebellious deeds, he's forgiving our sins one time, and that's all this response is necessary. He doesn't have to go back and forgive that same sin yet and all the way up. Absolutely. You think of in the Old Testament time, um, God's people brought these sacrifices for their own sake. It was their visual reminder that there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. The writer of the Hebrews writes that. And yet, did the, the blood of, of animals, of goats and bulls and sheep, did that take care of their sins? No. That's why every single day, again and again and again and again and again, they had to bring more animals, more animals, or blood. Um, but then when Christ came, as you said, Mark, very well, one sacrifice, done. All our sins are forgiven. All our sins are washed away. And He will remember them no more. Um, of course, we're not saying that God has short-term memory loss. Um, God knows exactly who we are. He knows exactly everything we've done and what we will do. But yet He says, in my love for you, I am not acting on them. I am pushing them off to the side. Um, I have forgiven them. Um, yeah, very um, awesome, awesome gospel message here. So with that, let's, let's go ahead and use that and as we close in prayer. And I, I failed to mention and in, in, include in our prayers for worship. If I don't write it down, I um, notice I just don't, I don't remember. I'm notorious for that. So um, Gary had mentioned in the beginning that, that Diana had requested a prayer. There's, um, did you say 12? Um, so 12 residents in her facility that recently tested positive for COVID and just um, when you consider the, the stress and strain that puts on those facilities as they really kind of have to lock down and tighten up. Um, so certainly a prayer for 
um, for her and the residents there as well as just um, everybody else as we kind of go through this tumultuous time. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you know all things. You're in control of all things. You are our King, our Holy One, our Redeemer, our Lord, our God, and our faithful grace. Lord, we ask you to continue to look over the world as it's um, in tumult. Um, as we see the chaos of sin, as we see the effects of sin um, wreaking havoc on an imperfect world, we ask you to remind us and use this as an opportunity to shed light on others, um, to others um, of who you are, that you are our God who loves us dearly and is faithful to us. Lord, be um, with um, the facility where, where Diana Nazar is working, um, with all the residents there um, that have tested positive, as well as with um, everybody else, um, especially in those independent living centers, those nursing homes, um, um, who have to take those extra um, measures of, of keeping people safe. Um, Lord, we ask you to be with all of them as they grow weary and grow tired of all of these different protocols and, and all of these different steps to make sure that everyone is safe. Remind them that their safety and their peace um, finally rests in you, our God of faithful love to us. Um, Lord, help us all to, re to always remember of the forgiveness of sins of what an incredible miracle that is. Help us never to take it for granted, but to always instead cherish it, run back to hearing, running back to hearing it again and again. Lord, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right, Lord bless the rest of you.